All right, all right. Good evening and good night, and welcome to the It's Your Perspective Talk Show. It is uh, Thursday, May 5th, 2016. My name is David, a.k.a. Kimba, a.k.a. Christian Longside. King is soup. Yeah, uh, yes, soup, we're back again. Live and direct. Yeah, man, this is the It's Your Perspective Talk Show. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, weekly, 8 p.m. until. We do have a telephone number tonight, 340 2019005 can also text us on that number as well. But most importantly, you have to go to our website, streaming live from the vi.com. Uh, if you're too shy to call or text, hit us up with an email. Our email address is streaming live from the vi at yahoo.com uh, as well. Uh, what else we got here? Um, we're in a high tech, low tech studio, man. This is where we're at. This is where we broadcast our show from. Uh, no radio or TV, internet only. Get your iPhone, uh, your Android. Your, um, your, um, your tablet, your iPad, your Mac, or your Windows PC. Open up your browser, type in streaming live from the vi.com, and you'll be able to see the entire show tonight as we do have a special guest, long time special guest in the studio tonight. Uh, what else we got here? All our recorded live shows are on YouTube and ustream.tv. Uh, we're well over 300 now, Soup. Yes, sir. Right. We just continue to add shows, uh, at least three shows a week for sure, you know? Yes, sir. And we got two Facebook pages. Uh, definitely want to give a shout out to. Uh, CHS class of 1982. That's the year that Super and I represent. If you are out there, our classmates are out there, here, there, and everywhere, hit us up. Let us know how you're doing. Uh, but most importantly, to all our past guests, thanks for being on our show. We're on Twitter. Hit us up at uh, VI Perspective. Tweet with us there. And uh, we're moving straight forward and up. The show's mission is just to inform, entertain, and empower everyone. And we'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Magdalene's Party Decorations and Supersonic Computer Services. Go to our website, streaming live from the vi.com to get the contact info for uh, Magdalene's Party Decorations and Supersonic Computer Services. And uh, as we move on here, Soup, you ready? Yes, I. All right, bless that mic, man. Rastafari lives. Greeting to one and all. In the name of His Divine Majesty, Kidamal Wimpai, this is I the first. Today is the blessed anniversary of the um, Ethiopian Liberation Day. Um, May 5th, 1945, when His Majesty returned, back to this, returned forward to the throne of Ethiopia during the war of Italy and, um, and Ethiopia, when Italy invaded Ethiopia and the world sat by and watched. Um, so this is a very significant day for I and I and Ethiopians <coughs> all over the world. So it's just one perfect, blessed love to one and all. Um, I'm gonna read from the utterance concerning world peace of His Majesty Heidi Selassie I. Peace, universally heralded by the angels at the birth of our savior has become even more necessary to mankind than if than ever before. The alternatives confronting the governments of today are no longer peace or war, but peace or the, the alienation and the complete doom of mankind. Therefore, it has now become the noble responsibility of Christians and peoples of other faiths and their leaders throughout the world to pray and to work hard for the preservation of world peace. The problem that confronts us today are equally unprecedented. They have no counterparts in human experiences. Men search the pages of history for solutions, for precedents, but there are none. This then is the ultimate challenge. Where are we to look for our survival, for the answers to the questions that have never been before posed? We must look first to the Almighty Jah, who has raised man above the animals and endowed him with intelligence and reason. We must put our faith in him that he will not desert us or permit us to destroy humanity that he created in his image. We must look into ourselves, into the depth of our souls. We must become something we have never been and for which our education and experience and environment have ill prepared us. We must become bigger than we have been, more courageous, greater in spirit, larger in outlook. We must become members of a new race, overcoming petty prejudice, owing our ultimate allegiance not to the nations but to our fellow men within the human community. Our praises be to the living eye. Ja Rastafari. All right, all right. right. Soup, uh, as promised, we do have a very, very special guest in the studio tonight. Long time guest here from the very beginning, April of 2014. Here he is, author Gary James. Welcome back to the studio once again, man. How yes, you doing sir. tonight? Lovely, great, man. It's always good to be back here with you brothers. Yes, I go. I was have I was a pleasure to have you in our <laughs> presence. <laughs> so how you doing, brother Gary? Good, 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 excellent. Uh, we're going to uh depart from politics 
uh, this evening and uh, get a little heavy. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> so good evening and welcome to Conversations with Gary James, brought to you by It's Your Perspective talk show, streaming live and direct from an undisclosed location on the big island of St. Croix. That's it. That's right. The issue of Virgin Island status is a resounding and fundamental question that I became acquainted with after relocating from New York to St. Croix several years ago. And while exploring the issue of VI status in particular, and the identity of descendants from former enslaved Africans in general, I began to focus on the seven European colonial masters responsible for establishing the status of indigenous peoples and their lands. The United Nations Resolution 1514 regarding the right of self-determination of indigenous inhabitants and their countries is without question relevant to the VI status issue and it's a topic of many informal conversations as I am learning. But the international law associated with the United Nations and the previous arbiter of international law, the League of Nations, they were not in existence when the New World was discovered and conquered. The laws of nations was the relevant international law that was in place prior to the discovery of the New World and the advent of the United States of America. Interestingly enough, or perhaps ironically, the ancient international law known as the Laws of Nations is currently enforced by the U.S. Constitution. If you have access to the U.S. Constitution, read Article One, and you could appreciate what we're saying. The Laws of Nations was in fact designed and enforced by the Vatican. And it was later adopted by the Protestant reformers and it is, as we mentioned, currently enshrined in the Constitution. Essentially, the laws of nations confers certain rights to European Christian monarchs to discover, conquer, and subdue indigenous peoples with the option to Christianize them. As we explore the origin and circumstances regarding the status of indigenous peoples, we will examine various forces, seen and unseen, that continues to advance their global objectives. The Knights of Malta are an example of the forces that are seen and unseen who continue their work. And the Knights of Malta are among the colonial masters of the Big Island of St. Croix. A brief historical overview regarding the Knights of Malta. 
the Knights of Malta, first off, is a religious order of the Roman Catholic Church that was formally recognized by the papacy in 1113. It was originally founded as a monastic hospitaler order by Brother Gerard, also known as Blessed Gerard. Brother Gerard was serving with other brothers at a hospice in Jerusalem at that time. And at that time, different orders of monks, such as the Benedictines, who form the Knights Hospitalis, which was initially founded as a nursing order in Jerusalem, had their members also trained as warrior knights. By the middle of the 12th century, the Hospitaller Order was clearly divided into two groups, those who worked with the sick and those who were members of the military. Thus, the Knights Hospitaller became a military order that defended pilgrims journeying to the Holy Land along with the Templar Knights or Knights Templar. The Hospitalis then evolved into a very powerful Christian group whose members distinguished themselves in battle against Muslims for control of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Brother Gerard initially acquired money and territories for the order, lands in Jerusalem and outlying locations. However, since the Knights Hospitaller was still considered a religious order, it was granted special privileges by the papacy. For example, members were only subject to the authority of the papacy. They weren't required to pay any tithes and they were allowed to own property and buildings. At the height of the power, the order held some 150 estates in the area of Jerusalem and seven forts. When Accra was captured by Muslims in 1291, the presence of Christianity was ousted from the Holy Land. So Brother Gerard's order sought refuge in Greece. Brother Gerard and his order ultimately found a permanent venue when they captured the island of Rhodes in 1309. And when the Knights Templar was persecuted and had their holdings confiscated by the Catholic Church and King Philip the Fair in 1312, much of their property was given to the Knights Hospitaller. At that point, their name changed to Order of Rhodes. Subsequently, land in Spain, England, France, Germany and Italy came into their possession. This development caused the monastic order to become much wealthier than it had ever been. They were also required to become more militaristic and members began fighting Barbary pirates.
that's a, another story we'll, we'll get into later at another time. The order was constantly engaged in military, engaged militarily with the Sultan of Egypt in 1444 and in 1522 in particular. When the order was defeated by Suleiman, members of the Knights Hospitaller were allowed to retreat to Sicily. They were ultimately granted a presence in Malta by King Charles I of Spain in 1530 with the permission of the King of Sicily. The order then became known as the Knights of Malta. They moved their headquarters to Rome in 1834, where it exists currently. The move to Rome was in part due to the fact that Napoleon had captured Malta in 1798, and although deposed, the group kept its name by becoming the sovereign military order of Malta. With the advent of the Protestant Reformation, the now Protestant states, such as Germany under the Lutherans, remember Martin Luther, and England under King Henry VIII, who started the Church of England, cut the Pope loose, they confiscated many of the Knights of Malta's holdings, thereby decreasing their wealth dramatically. They were in a state of flux from the defeat by Napoleon and the circumstances with Protestant Germany and England. They were reorganized in 1875. The Pope had given them the status of Grand Master. A Grand Master is recognized as a head of state and has the ecclesiastical ranking equivalent to a Cardinal as far as the church is concerned. It is also during this time of turmoil among Catholics and Protestant authorities that the branch known as the most venerable order of St. John of Jerusalem was formed. This Protestant offshoot of the Knights of Malta was recognized by the Catholic order in 1963, 1963, that's pretty recent. It's interesting to note that both orders have sovereignty and were given observer status at the United Nations. This means that both orders can issue passports for diplomatic immunity which they frequently do. Although the Knights of Malta assert that they are an organization open to everyone, only a lesser membership is granted to lay people. To be an elite member, you must be Catholic and show a royal bloodline for at least 100 years. Many of the Knights of Malta's alliances and actions in the past and present are clandestine in nature, mostly due to their being controlled by the Vatican. For example, the order was linked to the rat run, in quotes, 
And the Rat Run is a post-World War II escape route for high-ranking Nazis to evade war trials. Reports are that some of these individuals were issued sovereign Knights of Malta passports that allowed them to escape to the Americas out of Germany. The Knights of Malta are also known to be anti-communists because of their Catholic and aristocratic roots. This stance has led to strong ties with the CIA and their involvement in the Cold War with Russia. In fact, one of the founders, founding fathers of the CIA, William Wild Bill Donovan, was awarded the Grand Cross of the Order by Pope Pius XII. This is a prestigious papal knighthood and the highest Catholic award ever received by an American. The influence of the Knights of Malta is strongest in Latin America and Africa. The list of prominent and controversial and consequential individuals associated with the order is astounding and far-reaching including countries and institutions such as the Vatican Bank, the brains behind the infamous P2 Lodge was reportedly the brainchild of a knight, the Knights of Malta. Knights of Malta members have had alliances with questionable nature of questionable nature with the help of high-ranking members of the Catholic Church and the Vatican. For example, Joseph Rettinger, one of the founders of the Bilderberg Group, was a former Knight of Malta and agent of the Vatican. Cardinal Francis Spellman of New York was reportedly directly involved in the 1954 military coup in Guatemala that murdered thousands and in which the CIA has admitted complicity. Spellman has also been linked to the South American P2 group through his long involvement with acknowledged member, Archbishop Paul Masinkus. The Archbishop headed the Vatican Bank and enjoyed immunity as an employee of the Vatican. So there are many intrigues that we can recount, but our only point is to point out what components contribute to the nature of our past vis-a-vis -vis the establishment, development, and maintenance of the new world and the status of indigenous peoples. The Knights of Malta are currently very much involved in trying to get Europe to accept one president. In fact, many of the so-called medieval religious, quote unquote, secret societies are working strongly in today's political realm. During the Middle Ages, the world was basically ruled by royalty and religion, while nowadays, politics and money are also contributing factors. But many of these organizations just follow the power trail. 
Excuse me. We fast forward to today. Today's world, we observe virtually all the same players and systems remain seen and unseen. And the ancient laws of nations remain a factor in international law by way of the Constitution of the United States, Article 1. And as pointed out, the VI status issue was defined and established in the framework of the laws of nations. So we're going to explore examples of the laws of nations in a series of conversations going forward. Therefore, we'll call this evening's conversation the first of a series of conversations in this regard. The conversations going forward will explore how the laws of nations operates over the millennia and what is the origin of this international law which survives in the U.S. Constitution. In exploring how the law continues to operate, we will offer brief historical overviews of organizations and institutions, known and unknown, while exploring linkages to their broader national and world context. During our next conversation, we will offer a brief historical overview of the Bilderberg Group, which was mentioned briefly earlier. The Bilderberg Group is a contemporary organization that generally operates in a clandestine mode. We'll talk about the group next time. And we'll also talk about the origin of the laws of nations and critical definitions and identifications that have provided a basis for popular ideas and systems that we operate currently as well as entertain. This conversation series is exploring examples of how the laws of nations continues to animate the world and in fact uh, inform my worldview. But perhaps more importantly, it helps to inform my appreciation and understanding of my status as a Virgin Islander and a descendant of former enslaved Africans in the New World. The current historical and political discussion of the VI status question in the framework of the United Nations resolutions on self-determination for indigenous peoples is an important conversation and will likely uh, continue. Hopefully, it will continue. But equally important is the need to explore and examine the origin and nature of many ideas and concepts that have formulated the popular and public historical narrative. So that's essentially our presentation for uh, today. Today is this evening's conversation. But I'd like to um, piggyback on the point that uh, Suit made regarding the liberation of Ethiopia uh, 
May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. May 5th is celebrated as Ethiopia's Liberation Day following the defeat of the fascist invaders. And I want to mention the legacy of my mentor and spiritual father, Ras Kassa, and his family in commemoration of their contribution to the occasion of the liberation of Ethiopia. Ras Kassa, formerly named the Jazz Match, which means Governor General of Ethiopia. His Excellency Amaha Abera Zion Kaza. I studied with him for, for more than 20 years. And this is his bio, his basic pedigree. First of all, he has I will reference three citations, three fraternities that uh, he is a member of. OM, which is the Order of Minilik. GCSE, which means the Grand Cross Star of Ethiopia. And GCSD, Grand Cross Star of David. His Excellency, the Jazz Match, Amaha Abera Zain Kaza, also known as Professor Kaza by his students, is the scion of three major lines of royal blood in Ethiopia. Professor Kaza's father, the Jazz Match Abera Kaza, was the son of His Highness Leul Ras Kaza, Helu, Prince of Saleh, Senior Prince of the House of Shoa, Senior Prince of the Blood and President of the Crown Council for, the most, uh, for most of the reign of Emperor Haile Selassie. Abera Kaza himself was the defendant, was a descendant of the Shoan branch of the Imperial Solomonic Dynasty on his mother's side and the Zigwe Dynasty on his father's side. The Jazz Match and his brothers, the Jazz Matches Woldewozen and Azvu Wozen Kaza assembled insurgent forces against the fascist Italian occupation in 1936 and led a daring attempt to liberate Addis Ababa in 1937 that failed. They were tricked into surrendering and then executed. The jazz match Amaha's mother, wife of the jazz match Abera, Wolizu Siyam, can't pronounce that too well, was the daughter of the Prince of Tigray. His Holiness Leu Ras Siyam, Magesa, and a great granddaughter of Emperor Yohasis the fourth. She became a great resistance fighter on her own right when she gathered up the remnants of her husband's army following his murder and led them into battle against the Italian fascist occupation forces in 14 battles before retreating into the British ruled Sudan. Following the liberation of Ethiopia in 1941, young Dejazmatch 
Amaha returned to Ethiopia with his mother and brothers. The jazz match went on to study at Oxford and later served the imperial government in a variety of court positions in Ethiopia as well as diplomatic postings abroad. He served as the governor of Gondor briefly and later represented Ethiopia in Geneva and was ambassador to Yugoslavia and West Germany. In the early 1950s, he worked diligently on the process of election and introduced it to Ethiopia by going from province to province, empowering the people. He endeavored to help them understand that their voice counts and encouraging them to come out and vote for, for one that they believe the best, their best interest would serve the province. In the early 1970s, prior to his imprisonment, he served as an advisor to the Crown Council, a post that advised the king on any major decisions, the king or emperor. The Dazmach Professor Kaza also was also president of the Ras Kaza Welfare Foundation for many years. The foundation had many services under its umbrella and some of the works are as follows. Renovation of churches, opening health centers in the neighborhoods, opening schools in neighborhoods, and renovating old ones. Evaluating development opportunities in rural areas and partnering with foreign resources to support expertise and opportunities. Following the revolution and coup of 1974, the jazz match was arrested as an aristocrat and relative of the imperial family and was imprisoned for eight years. Subsequent to his release, he went into exile in the United States where he lived in New York City. The author of the Imperial Ethiopia website is well acquainted with the Jazmach, who generally shared with him the extensive knowledge, his extensive knowledge of Ethiopian history and imperial practices and customs. So I am pleased to uh, uh, share that on this occasion and also point out that uh, my, uh, uh, my mentor had the uh, uh, honor of settling the Rastafari community in Shashimani land during the 60s. So we have a, a, a special uh, relationship with the Rastafari and by way of the uh, monastery that I am the dean of deacons and students uh, in. Uh, we are in the process of developing a, a, a database for lay people to understand the historical procession of uh, Ethiopia's contribution to world Christianity. So with that, my brothers, I thank you for uh, this opportunity to share this information and do another episode of Conversation with Gary James. And I'll see you guys. When was the next one, bro? Uh, the next date is uh, May 19th. May 19th. Uh, 2016. That's uh, basically two weeks from today. Good, good. Good, good. We're yes. ready. We're ready. And All you right. see, I shortened it up a little bit for you guys, man. I yeah. don't want you guys doing too much overtime. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right, man. Uh, that was uh, author Gary James. Thanks for coming out to the show again tonight. Gary has been with us from the very, very beginning since April of 2014. He actually is in his second season. That's right. I think we lost count on what episode of the second season you're in. <laughs> but, we uh, certainly did. <laughs> but I think you got uh, like another month or so to go. Another month. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on uh, a vacation. I'm going in this, to the States in July. Okay. So I got a... Uh, 
I still got May and June now. Right, right. Don't rush me out of here, bro. <laughs> well, we're in May now, so you got May, just another another month, another month. You know, I was correct when I said that. Um, but uh, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate that, Gary. Good, good. And uh, Gary's been a long time supporter of the show. What we're doing here, we're just trying to uh, push on and, and do some positive, positive things. Um, Soup, any uh, any any closing words? Any final final words, man? Gary, again, thank you on this blessed historic day, Ethiopian Liberation Day. To all Ethiopians all over the world, blessed Ethiopian Liberation Day. Rastafari live, more love, more blessings, one love. All right, man. Um, so that's it for us this week. Uh, we do uh, have some shows lined up for next week. Um, I think on next week Thursday, um, whatever that date is, we have uh, Mother Nile is coming in the studio. That should be a big, big show, man. She was here a few months back, but uh, she'll be here again to give us uh, some vibes and a lot of good things, you know? Yes, I. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, but as Soup said, uh, as I like to continue on, uh, one perfect love is our praise and his blessings. When you put it all together, you get one perfect love. So everybody have a good weekend. We're out for the next four days. Uh, enjoy yourselves. Have a good weekend. Stay dry if it's raining and, and stay cool if it's uh, hot. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that came out right, right? And uh, and have fun at the beach. Whatever you do, be safe. And we're out until uh, next week, Tuesday. Peace. Peace.